born in um, Nyeri and grew up um, in different parts of the country. Um, have grown up in Nairobi, have grown up in Machakos, in Nyeri. Um, and I went to school in different parts of the country too. Um, so did my high school in Alliance Girls in Kikuyu. Then after high school, I got a scholarship to attend um, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge um, in the US. And uh, I studied there, did a degree in electrical engineering and a minor in economics and uh, worked uh, a bit in the US, but then very, uh, got a chance to come back home and I was very excited to be able to come back home. And so that uh, I've been back home since 2008. I think I was always interested in different things, but partly because I was good and interested in science, um, engineering became a sort of natural progression, but also because it was the kind of, um, it was an interesting choice because it allowed me to explore my science uh, interest, but also uh, it was a very good, good way of training me in analytical thinking and ability to just solve problems. And so that, that, you know, that, that's what got me interested in engineering. Um, and getting a chance to go into MIT, which is the best engineering school in the world, um, was also just a way that I was there, so I said, you know what, I might as well get a degree in engineering. I've been reading statistics where girls tend to do better in science classes, especially when you look at um, KCSE results. So it's quite interesting that up till from four, girls are still really good, are just as good as boys, um, as far as science classes are concerned. And of course, there's a stereotype that engineering belongs to men. I don't know where it came from, but maybe it's also something that's very historical. But the more you think about the fact that it's just, just the same way you are doing physics or uh, biology or, or any other class that you're doing in high school, it's the same way you continue to do that um, in university, just that it becomes a lot more advanced. And so, just encouraging girls, at the end of the day, do what you're interested in and don't feel like this is something that belongs to men, this is something that belongs to women. If you're good at something and you have an interest and a passion for it, um, engineering doesn't know that you're a boy or a girl. At the end of the day, um, if you can study hard and get, you know, get your grades well, um, it works out great. So I'd encourage girls, yeah, definitely, if it's something they're passionate about, you know, let's, let, let them go for it. Across the board, you do, hear women having different challenges and this happens whether it's in engineering or it's in any other field that someone does um, definitely things are a lot better than they were when you read when you read stories of women that started working in the 60s and 70s they definitely had a lot more challenges than we have um, people are more used to seeing women now um, in boardrooms in, in in labs etc but you still will hear comments especially when you go into places where people are a lot more um, I'll use the word chauvinistic or, you know, or are not necessarily used to seeing women at the front. And sometimes you will hear some comments where someone might ask, oh, you're such a small girl, what are you doing here, or ETC. But the thing is to always let your work speak for itself. And so the more people know that this is, this is about you, this is, it's about the work. It's not really about whether you're a boy or a girl. Um, eventually people begin to respect you and you can be able to sort of rise above the comments and just focus on your work and making sure that you're really good at what it is that you're doing. In as much as I've done a lot of work in engineering and technology, um, I've always been at heart um, a Pan-African and I've always thought about questions, deep questions around how do we, how do we grow this continent? Um, how do we take advantage of the resources that we have in this continent um, and begin to you know, figure out ways to leapfrog you know, from where we are? And in particular, the one key question that I know that we need to answer is a question around the young people. We're a very young continent, everyone knows that, and we're getting younger. And for me, I keep thinking about young people as an opportunity that can be harnessed for the betterment of the continent, rather than the challenge that sometimes people think that they are. And so it becomes important for me to figure out where do we identify young people, how do we train them to think differently, so that we're preparing them for the leadership challenges that they will face um, as they go, you know, as they take on um, different opportunities in life. And so that's something I'm really passionate about, which is young people in Africa, their minds, and how we begin to get them to think about transforming the continent, um, but from a very unique perspective of being Africans. And so when ALA came along, um, in many ways, it, it's, it, it solved, or at least for me, it was a way to, uh, you know, address this, these three key issues, which is it's, it's young people, it's leadership um, on the continent, and it's transformation of minds. Um, so that's how that shift came about. Of course, um, there's a bit of an interesting learning curve, but because it's something that I'm very passionate and something that I'm actually given to do, I, 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 look, I, I reflect on my own life, and I see 
where I am in many ways is because of people that I've looked up to or people that I have set good examples for me. Um, and so whether it's you know my family, my parents, um, teachers, or people that I've worked with, there's always been someone I would say, you know what, there's something they are doing and I like what they are doing. Um, and they'd always be like, how do I grow to become like them? And so in many ways, I naturally think that I have to, it's the same thing, that that's, that's the path I was set for me. I need to kind of set the same pathway for other people. And so it's, so I don't know whether it's a question of how it makes me feel as, that's, as, as much as that's my life. Um, and secondly, in many ways, they say you become, you need to become the change that you want to see in the world. So I cannot be saying, well, I want to see the world become a better place or I want this and this to happen in the world. Yet I myself am not reflecting the same values that I'm demanding to see of others. And so if I do live out and become these values, then naturally people will, the people that I'm leading or the people that I'm working with, I'm able to look up to someone and say, oh, she's living out the values that she wants to see in the world. And so it's very much, it's, it's, it's very much a, a, a responsibility from that perspective where I know people are looking up to me. Um, I do have the students, my staff, um, and just the outside world um, looking up to me. And so it's important that you set an example that if they become what I am, then I, I, I think the world will become a better place. Of course, every day you wake up, there's always quote unquote a challenge. And that's part of being a leader and that's part of being a CEO. I mean, the, your biggest job is constantly solving problems. You know, usually no one will come to you when things are great. For as long as things are going well, you know, everyone is fine. It's when situations come up, that's when you see emails or you see calls and you say, you know, this has happened or there's a crisis. And I mean, when I think about my last role even before I joined ALA, I mean, there'll always be a, you know, there'll be a crisis, for example, are we able to, you know, are we going to meet our revenue targets? Um, are we going to be able to meet our, you know, operating expenses? Uh, or there might be a regulatory challenge, ETC. But I choose to see them as part of the role and dissociate them from, oh, it's because I'm a woman, then this is why this is happening, as much as I'm the CEO and this is why the challenges are coming to my table, what then do we need to do to solve them? Um, the other thing is I realize that someone has to solve the problem and a lot of times it has to be me. So when the challenge comes, yes it is, and sometimes something will hit you and you're like, this is hard, how, you know, and you're trying to figure out how do we go about it, um, do I need to call people, can I get advice, etc. But it's recognizing that at the end of the day, I still need to solve for that particular problem. And sometimes, you know, you make decisions, they, they might work out, they might not work out. Um, but the big learning I've had to do is not to beat myself up too much. So if, if a challenge comes my way and we try and solve it and it probably doesn't work out the way I think it sh I thought it should have worked out, learn from it and make sure the next time it happens, you know, you know, in, in, I know better what to do. But I realize if I don't do that, it's very easy to beat on yourself and you know, you almost leave, you're almost living based on your last challenge. And no matter what's happening, you always, oh, but you know, when this happened, I remember this. And, you know, you almost become a slave to that particular challenge, as opposed to, okay, this happened, we made a decision, it worked out great, yeah, it didn't work out great, we learned, but let's pick ourselves up and move on to the next thing. What we call challenges are actually just opportunities for us to find better solutions. I think women bring a very unique perspective to the table. Um, and it's important that, um, as you said, it's being, you know, it's changing and there's a lot more recognition to what women can bring to the table and it's definitely not what it was. Um, but it's important that um, that continues to be accepted and, you know, given, given, given precedence. Um, so there are, two ways I, there, are, there are two ways I think about it. On, on the one hand, there's a role that one is to do. And so if a CEO, for example, the organization should not necessarily suffer because I'm a woman or a man. You know, at the end of the day, what needs to get done, whatever challenges or situations that need to be solved, whether you're a woman or a man, you need to be able to solve them. And that's one thing that we shouldn't be able to, or we shouldn't be pushing for leadership as women just for the sake of, I'm a woman, so give me the role. You know, there has to be some level of, you're qualified to do it and you're willing to do the work and you do a better, and can do a good job at it. But secondly, um, as I said, I think women bring a very interesting and unique perspective. And they are, we, are, we have the population. And so in many ways, we are doing ourselves a disservice if we are not giving women <laughs> the roles that they need, or at least the opportunities to take on some of these key roles. Um, there's a lot of potential that is inherent in women that's not necessarily being harnessed if we are not necessarily making room and headway for, 
for them to be in the leadership roles um, that they, they can and should be taking on. And so my take on it is, and my hope is that I would actually encourage more you know, younger women um, to keep going at it and to, you know, to not shy away from taking on roles as they come along. Because I, I find sometimes we as women shy away from you know, taking up that leadership position in when, or taking up a promotion. And so when, when something comes up, you sort of say, no, I'm not, I don't think I'm really good enough. Yet yeah, the man will, you know, <laughs> will go for it and actually get the same role. Um, so how do we encourage young women or just encourage women in general not to shy away from opportunities as they come along because they have something to offer. And the country, Africa, needs them just as much as um, it needs men. So it is something that needs to be encouraged, but we also need to encourage them to make sure that um, they are, they are growing to be good enough. So it's not, you're not getting a role just because you're a woman. You're getting the role because you're good enough. And then you can bring in a unique perspective as a woman. I do have a passion for young people, for leadership on this continent and transforming minds. And so getting this role was, you know, in some ways saying, you know what, you're actually on the right path. Um, these things that I'm very passionate about, I was able to convince a group of people that, you know what, I can actually, I'm actually the best person to help you lead your institution that's focused on these things. Um, and of course, to some extent, uh, being a woman, as you said, and being the first um, Kenyan, of course, very proud for my country. Um, and just something that you continue to showcase that Africa, but Kenya in particular, continues to produce some really excellent people, I think. Um, so I think it was a great, for me it was a great opportunity to just showcase what my country can do. I have a friend who says that um, how you do one thing is how you'll do everything. <laughs> how you do one thing is how you'll do everything. And the reason I find that very powerful is in answering your question, because sometimes, as you say, people, you, one would assume, well, it's a day I'm gonna become a leader is when I'll become all these things. Um, as opposed to recognizing that if you start early, so if there are things that you value um, and you actually start practicing them when no one is seeing, then you'll actually become that thing naturally. And the day when someone is actually seeing, you'll actually have become that thing. So what I mean by that is, um, if say I want to be someone who's responsible or someone who um, is, uh, what's the word here? Who works hard or is, um, is diligent, etc. Sometimes people think, oh, I'll wait until I have a big opportunity, then I'll show this how diligent I can be, or here, yeah, I'm, I'm a responsible human being, etc. But you forget that even just at home, as you're growing up, um, how diligent are you? How responsible are you? If you say you'll do something, do you keep your word? So those values that are important, as, as a, you know, at what people say are important values as a leader, if we can find ways to begin to nurture them and grow them when no one is seeing, then the day the opportunity comes, you'll naturally have become that person. As opposed to saying, oh, I'll be one thing right now, but the day when the opportunity comes, that's when I will become this thing. Um, it, it, it doesn't work that way. And that's why by the time opportunity comes, people can, they can pick out and say, oh, this person takes initiative, this person is responsible, etc. And so that's the one, th one thing, yeah, so to answer your question, I would encourage young people to begin to look at what are the values they think are important for leadership and actually begin to cultivate them now, even in their small quote-unquote roles. So for example, if you get your first job, you're an intern, how well are you doing it? Are you showing up on time? Um, are you keeping your deadlines? Are you able to communicate? Are you able to, uh, when you say you'll do something, are you able to deliver it? So those very key qualities that actually make um, quote-unquote good leader, start practicing them when you're an intern. People will notice you. And people watch, um, and someone might say, oh, that's a really good intern. Can I keep them for this other role that I want? And keep growing yourself um, at that level. So naturally, leadership will come from that end, as opposed to saying, oh, it's a day I get this big job, then I'll become a leader. And in many ways, that ties down back to my role at, at ALA. Because we are training young leaders, it's basically in the belief of that, which is if we can begin to instill these values of ethics, um, Work, you know, working hard, um, etc. We can begin to instill those values at an early age. Then we hope that this, they will actually become that, and then they will naturally progress into the leaders that they ought to become. Do the right thing. Um, I know it sounds very simple, but it's something I've always told um, my team members or people that I've worked with. Um, do things that you're okay. If you saw it in the newspaper the next day, you, you won't be worried, etc. Um, you know, we talk a lot about corruption and bribery and all those kinds of things. Um, but we lose sight of the fact that 
if, you know, it's easy to kind of blame it on other people, but when, when, the, when, when you're the one who has to make a decision, um, are you making the decision that you're like, you know what, this is actually the right decision? Or are you being pressured to, oh, I kind of want, want this to happen, or um, I, could make, I could make some money here, etc. And there, it's very easy sometimes to be like, oh, the short term, in the short term, we can make things go faster if we bribe someone or if we do something like that. Um, as opposed to, just take the longer route. Um, it might take, might take longer, but you'll sleep better at night. And you won't have to be worried that, you know, five, ten years down the line, this candle will come up and, you know, and, and, um, and start bothering you again. So it's one thing I've always told, at least for me, it's been something I've lived by. Just do the right thing. Um, it might mean sometimes you move a bit slower. People might wonder, oh, why are you not just taking shortcuts? Um, but I found that it just it just makes for a better way to live life and, and run and run companies. The other thing is people matter. As I said, I I am very passionate about people. And I've come to appreciate that for me to build good organizations, I need great people. A lot of times people might, might come and they might need a bit of nurturing, a bit of mentorship. But if you if you nurture people accurately, or they will surprise you at the amount of creativity and initiative, and just they will grow you, in, or they will grow the organization in, in ways that you would not have thought is possible. And so, being able to bring out the best in people, I think, is something I'm constantly striving to and trying to become better at. Um, but just that ability to appreciate people bring such amazing energies and talents, but you need to be able to figure out how to nurture and and bring them out because otherwise a lot of times I find that someone goes to work somewhere and maybe they're working for a bad boss um, or people who are very competitive or very political um, who they are get suppressed and you, you meet someone and you almost forget, it's almost like they forget who they are then you shift that person and put them in an environment where they're being nurtured and you come back and you're like are you the same person you know the amount of energy and um, creativity they're able to bring the t to the table is amazing and so that ability to always just appreciate people and always find a way to try and grow them, I think for me is really, really important. Um, and finally, I think to be able to do things, I mean, not, only, not everyone gets a chance to do that, but if you can do things that you're passionate about, um, it's, it, it makes all the difference. Um, sometimes I think people just find themselves in roles and they, they're, they're not happy. Um, they, they'll probably do it maybe because of what people think or you know, um, how, you know, how much money does this make as opposed to, is this actually really what something I'm passionate about? Am I excited to wake up every morning to do this? And a lot of times people will be afraid to make the decisions because of you know, either fear or what, whatever fears that they might have. But I find that if you're able to be bold enough to sort of say, you know what, this is actually what I'm supposed to be doing and actually make the switch, you'll be happy and you'll actually be a lot more productive. The youth in Africa and how we explore the potential that is in them is, in my mind, I think it's huge. Um, and it continues to grow because, as I said, we are, we, are young, we are a young continent and we're only getting younger. And so, in many ways, um, being, a, being, in a, being, in, being in a place where I'm helping solve for that, and whether it's within you know, the work I'm doing at ALA, um, some work with technology because that's still my background and things that I'm, you know, uh, still something I'm passionate about. Um, so I think in an intersection that allows me to be to do those those things, which is youth, Africa, leadership, technology. What that looks like, I don't know, um, and I I trust God will get me there. So I I think for me right now is to live a day at a time, make sure that I'm doing my best at my current situation. And I'll find myself there. I look at myself, I look at um, people that I work with, um, especially young people, and it fills me with a lot of hope that there's a lot of potential on this continent. And my hope, or at least my, what, part of my work, but my hope also is that we'll continue to invest in young people um, and get them to actually recognize who they really are and what they can be. And really looking forward to a better Africa in our lifetime. So you can find me on LinkedIn and on Twitter at uh, Bill Handy Rango. Um, and then you can, to, lead, to read more about ALA, um, definitely come to our website. Um, you'll find more information about me, more information about how to get engaged, um, both as a young student or um, as an aspiring leader or anyone who's just interested in leadership on the continent. Uh, we have a lot of information on our website and happy to share.